this is what we're talking about here. When we talk about trying to change the environment for the better, for the positive, to encourage people to be able to, to get around. Yeah, and I love this woman with her with a basket on her bike and two baskets. It's this is and and look at the dress she's wearing. This is a very dignified way to age. It's a dignified way to get around if you don't have mobility. It's and or you don't want to spend the money. And that's I mean, you talk to Gen Zers, they don't want to own cars. Volkswagen did a study and I think like more than 60% of Gen Zers never want to own a car. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Lindsay Sturman with the Livable Communities Initiative in Los Angeles, California. Uh, this is a fantastic discussion about the amazing work that they are doing on the ground there. It's a long one though, so we're gonna jump right into it with Lindsay. Enjoy. <laughs> Lindsay Sturman, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast, welcome. Thank you, John. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, Lindsay, I love to have my guests uh, just give a, a quick introduction to themselves. Uh, so please, who is Lindsay? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I am um, I'm on Twitter as Lindsay Loves Bikes, and I have a podcast called Bike Talk. I'm the co-host. Um, and I got really obsessed with bikes a few years ago. And I, I just think they're the key. The more you learn about them, the more you see how much they unlock in sort of like are the issues of a city. Um, wh one way to I th somebody pointed out this way, and I, I'm just like I get to hear all these stories about bikes. And if you're on bike Twitter, you know you're reading about it. And then with the podcast, I'm able to interview you know a Dutch expert on infrastructure. And the more you learn, as I said, is that cities really work best. You know, obviously walkable cities worked for thousands of years. We invented cities 11,000 years ago. But bikes really go with trolleys to make a city work. And cars worked for a while, but we've sort of overrun our cities. And we know that, you know, it doesn't, you know, you can't um, keep expanding roads. We know induced demand. So bikes hold this key to making mobility work, but they also actually are the key that makes housing work. And so that's what we, this group, the Livable Communities Initiative, which I'm so excited to tell you about, sort of discovered. And then we're a sprawling group that, you know, sometime, we're between 25 and 100 people, experts from UCLA, um, architects, urbanists, experts in mobility who have come together to try to understand how we LA got to the crisis we're in and come up with a framework and a plan to get us out, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Twitter and uh, we all tend to spend a little bit of time out on, on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> bike, Twitter. bike Twitter is still strong uh, out there. And so, yeah, uh, so there you are. Uh, Lindsay uh, loves bikes out on, on Twitter. So, so folks, if, uh, if you're not already following Lindsay, you definitely want to do that. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk we're going to talk all about this, this amazing group. And I'm glad, I, I love the way you sort of described it. It's, it's kind of this whole very, very um, varied group of, of folks that have come together for the Livable Communities Initiative. Um, where did that, that initial sort of seed get planted? Who, who really came up with this idea? Yeah, so we, um, we're a group of about 3,000 activists. At my neighborhood is it's called Larchmont. We're, we're in sort of the Hollywood area of Los Angeles. And we, you know, we knock doors, we phone bank um, for progressive causes. And we wanted to understand the housing crisis. And we, it was during COVID. And we, LA just has an absolute tragedy going on, right? It's, it's like our unhoused neighbors who, People, we all care very deeply about everybody in the city wants to figure out how to fix this. And we can't build housing. So um, my neighbor who runs this group, Hodge, Hangout Do Good, it's really wonderful and warm. Um, and she got us together. She called the housing huddle. Let's understand this. And, you know, we, so we, we did a ton of research. We honestly read like one guy in our group read thousands of pages from the Turner Center at Berkeley. Like what is, they study the cost of housing in California. Like we read, you know, we're kind of nerdy and wonky. So we, I literally signed up for office hours with professors at UCLA. You can sign up online, you get 10 minutes. So like, can you explain this to me very quickly? So as we were delving into it, we came to realize a few things. We have to build housing that's in dispute because um, there's been a war going on in many cities across America. We hear this 
about where should we put our housing? How do we build our housing? And we're, we took the tech, we're going to accept the data. We're going to accept the research. We're not going to sit here and quibble. We're not experts. And the data really is clear that we need to build in LA somewhere between 500,000 units of housing and a million units of housing. And it affects because we have a scarcity, our rents are twice what they should be, and that's what's driving our crisis. And it's kind of counter, counterintuitive, or it's like a couple steps, but once you kind of see it, it's like, okay, we need to build housing. And then we had conversations, a lot of difficult conversations, and we talked to NIMBYs. I'm a bit of a YIMBY. I kind of came in as a YIMBY, and, but we tried to figure out how to find common ground. And that's what right. we do as, as activists, you door knock and you try to meet people where they are and convince them to vote for your candidate. So <laughs> we, we did a lot of listening. And you don't have to go very far into, into this to realize that these issues are all interrelated and connected. And so uh, we look at land use and, and the zoning that is involved with that. You look at mobility and uh, parking minimum requirements. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. This is all interrelated and interconnected. Uh, you all have a wonderful five-minute video I propose that we go ahead and play that video now, Great. and then yeah. you and I can come back and, and talk and reflect on this a little bit. The Los Angeles housing crisis is twofold. The part we all see in our neighborhoods, tents and the encampments, and the part where everyday people can't afford housing near their jobs and in the neighborhoods where they want to live. So they have to live far away and deal with super commutes just to exist in Los Angeles. There are incredible programs to support our unhoused neighbors, but the homeless crisis is interconnected with the housing shortage, and every day more people fall into homelessness than we house. We need more homes if we're going to fix the problem. Builders lose money when they build small, affordable units. This is a housing and human dignity crisis, and to address it, we need to build more housing, almost 500,000 units, into neighborhoods where the jobs are like Culver City, the West Side, and Hollywood, that haven't built their fair share of affordable housing, and bringing community-driven revitalization for neighborhoods that haven't had their fair share of amenities. Why hasn't this been fixed? Because stakeholders can't agree where to put the housing, and when neighbors fight the housing, it starts a domino effect. Neighbors are concerned about aesthetics, height around residential houses, more neighborhood traffic, and of course, parking. We keep saying no, but what if there was something we could say yes to? What if we could create walkable, vibrant, mixed-use streets by building up on a few of our commercial corridors? We could have alfresco dining, wide sidewalks, slower cars and fewer of them, tree canopies, more local businesses, and even safe bike lanes, which gets us to the metro to go anywhere we need to without using our cars we'd essentially be creating a 15-minute city, meaning we could get to the most things we need within 15 minutes. And similar to places like New York and Boston, we can park a few blocks away in a parking structure, grab our cars when we need them. Truly a great way to live a car light life. Most people want to live in a walkable neighborhood, so much so that it can increase nearby property values by 15%. And you can live here without a car. And the thing that makes it so expensive to build housing is building parking. The parking can cost more than the unit and makes rents so expensive. Right now, the laws we have in place make it so builders almost always build luxury, the housing we don't want. Get rid of the parking and make it so builders build the housing we do want. Small, affordable units and walkable neighborhoods. Picture Westwood Boulevard. On one end, it terminates in Westwood Village, and on the other, in a residential area. Since people don't want major traffic in their neighborhoods anyway, and you've got the Purple Line as well as Sepulveda and the 405 right there, this street is a great candidate for building up. Plus, 63,000 people commute into Westwood for work every day, and UCLA doesn't house all of their students. Approximately 20% commute in. We worked with Koreatown artist Anna Duarte Benitez to do a before and after. Here's Westwood before, and here's after. You add the trees, slow the cars down, keep the parking, the stores stay, and then you build housing on top. 
we worked with an architect to design a building. And this 1.5 mile stretch has the capacity for over 16,000 new units. Let's look at Pico Boulevard, which is similarly poised for this because it's super underbuilt, but with these amazing pockets of community and restaurants. If you check out the street mix, which is basically a side view of the street, right now it's just cars. There's no design when it could look like this dedicated bus line that runs like a train, bike lanes, or even a trolley, which is so LA. It's not just a housing crisis. It's a crisis for working families and their pocketbooks, along with a moral crisis and a climate crisis. Building like this reverse engineers suburban sprawl. This is a tool from UC Berkeley that shows greenhouse gas or GHG reduction. If you look at VMT reduction, which is vehicle miles traveled, AKA less driving, an urban infill is building near jobs. LCI combines both, and we'll need to do this anyway. Because of the climate crisis and Los Angeles's dire need to reduce emissions, these Teslas aren't gonna cut it. Our city can't do this without drastically cutting traffic. This is the real old LA trolleys, and famously cheap housing. We want to do this fast, with urgency, and center the most affected, our unhoused neighbors. So far, the LA City Council has included LCI and their housing element with their eight-year plan to build housing. At the end of the day, this is really just a zoning change so that we can build up in opportune areas and ultimately improve the quality of life for everyone. Instead of luxury buildings and high-rise towers, Let's build the housing we do want. And what's that? Affordable models, small and medium-sized apartments, and walkable car light neighborhoods. All at zero cost to taxpayers to focus our limited public funding on the most vulnerable. Attainable homeowner opportunities for those who want them. So everybody can build equity and we can close the intergenerational racial wealth gap. Brilliant. <laughs> wow. That, that, you know, that video, I, I watched it. That's the third time to this morning I've watched it. <laughs> so, uh, fantastic. Well, very, very well done. What has the response been like to that video thus far? Okay. So what's the response to the video? Yeah. I think a lot of people really get it because people care, right? They care about the housing crisis. They care about high rents. They care about all aspects of it. And I think they could see a solution. Um, it's hard for Angelinos to get over the cars. That's like, that's our biggest thing we have to tiptoe around and kind of walk people through and, you know, as I said, meet people where they are. Um, but I think people are starting to get it. And then that was actually about a year ago and we keep expanding it. And what's interesting is people come at us with questions and then we go out and we try to find the answer. Um, we, we take every question seriously, every concern, because it's, it's like Obamacare. It has to work. <laughs> you can't just throw a policy out there that's going to be, you know, um, that's like designed, you know, it, it can have flaws. Right now, we've created a lot of programs that work, but they don't scale. And we want something that scales to meet the, the scope of the crisis. Right, right. So one of the, the visuals that, uh, it, that was used in there is a, is a beautiful visual of the 15-minute city. Of course, the 15-minute city became infamous this past week yeah. because, the, because the conspiracy theorists decided to die, grab a hold of it. But <laughs> That's how we know it's great. <laughs> exactly. It's, but I mean, I just, I was like, what? You've got to be kidding me. But uh, I, I'm glad that that was very much a part of it because- you know, for those of us who've been doing work in the in the urbanism world for you know, for quite some time now, I mean, we didn't have that terminology of the fifteen minute city, but we that's exactly what we've been talking about: is walkable, bikeable, uh, you know, communities where you can meet your daily needs with you know through active mobility. And and you're absolutely right. I mean, it, this this brings me back to really what you know, my family kind of grew up with when they, you know, first moved to Los Angeles, this was the, this is what it was like. 
I mean, and people don't think of Mm -hmm. L.A. as being, you know, a place where, you know, like this image here from Pasadena. Uh, Pasadena actually had a uh, a bicycle superhighway that they had built. (laughs) Uh, and, you know, going through the Highlands, uh, you know, park, uh, neighborhood, which is where our family home was, uh, mm-hmm. and, and still is actually, but yeah, th- that, that concept of walkable, bikeable communities and nodes and neighborhoods, uh, and then being able to combine that with the ability to, to go longer distances through, uh, you know, there was a great a great visual there of some of the the streetcars. And that's, that was what my great, great grandfather was a brakeman on the red car line. So it was very much, uh, you know, a a part of LA. In fact, LA had the largest streetcar system line system in the entire nation. It was so Mm -hmm. extensive, just amazing. It's our history, right? Yeah. Yeah. Going, going back to yeah. And they say now our traffic moves at 20 miles an hour because we're in so much traffic. The trolleys went the same speed. Right. We'd be better off with trolleys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the bike is an interesting sort of invention in the sense that the bike predates the car by a, a couple of decades. And well, at least the mass use of, of bicycles did. The bikes actually predated the, the you, motor vehicle, predated the car want, by even more. Do you sure. want me to do a quick sidebar on the sure. invention of the bike? Yeah, yeah. I just have to look up one date and I, I'll give it to you. It's the best story. And we were going to do it on the Bike Talk podcast. Oh, yeah, but yeah. The invention of the bike, I stumbled upon this story. So in 1820, it was actually in 1819, um, a super volcano went off called Mount Tambora. And the next summer, the ash covered Europe. It got all the way to Albany. Okay. The Mm. super, and it was in, it was in like, I think near Indonesia and it was called, it's called Ashfall. It's the ash that comes down from a volcano. And it was called the year without a summer, 1820 in Europe. And it blotted out the sun and all the children had to spend the summer indoors. And Mary Shelley was indoors in like a Vienna, like hotel. Mm. And she wrote, Frankenstein, because the kids oh, yeah. entertain themselves by writing. And the first vampire story was written too. Her friend right. wrote the first. So that was the summer without, that was the year without a summer. And um, meanwhile, it was also called the poor year and the ground froze um, in August. Everything failed. Crops failed all the way to Pennsylvania and the Germans ended up eating their horses. So a German man invented the bicycle. Very good. Very good. Not not very good that he that the the horses that had to be the consumed. horses. I feel bad for the horses. Uh, but uh, yeah, and uh, <laughs> as, yeah, I think that's that. It's a it's it's fantastic to get that context. That yes, the 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 bicycle actually did predate the automobile by quite a few years, and it, it's it's one of the most amazing inventions just in terms of just how uh, efficient it is to be able to to be able to get from from point A to point B. The point I wanted to make though is the fact that it's so incredibly crucial from an urban mobility perspective of being able to marry uh, the bicycle and transit. And that's another thing that the Dutch have done really, really well is being able to integrate that those two different mobility systems into a synergistic relationship so that you can uh, be able to ride the bike, you know, inherently rideable distances. And then it, for those longer distances, you can jump on transit. Uh, in their case, most of the longer distance transit is, is on the, the rail system and they have built up, you know, very, very efficient and very, very comfortable and safe uh, bicycle parking garages at the transit mm-hmm. line, at the transit stations. And so it's just an incredibly uh, synergistic and civilized approach at transportation uh, versus, you know, feeling like you, if it's beyond a few miles, I have to drive. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what's so interesting about the Dutch is that they study, they have 40 years of data and they, they study their engineers 
uh, there's a lot of engineering training because they have to they have to build levees to keep the water out of the country. So they're just very focused on data and evidence. And so they had 40 years of data on their transit and many years also on bikes. And they have they study at university departments, think tanks like we don't have a single bike program, you know, department in any university that I know of in America. So what they've done is they've 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 figured out how to perfect it. And what what kind of opened my mind to this is a systems engineer who formerly worked at Bird, Martin Tomas, joined our brain trust, and he's a mobility expert and he thinks in terms of systems. And the Dutch have really figured out how to build a system. And here here's this one thing I learned interviewing people on the podcast is that Buses don't scale unless they're fast and frequent. So a bus that stops at every tree, it doesn't scale. And this is where I think that Americans, we should be, if you pay attention to design and engineering, like for instance, we don't build bridges that fail or aircraft that fail. Like we we build right. stuff that is a, you know, the banking of a freeway is highly engineered so you don't flip your car when you turn. We somehow bike lanes, we've just decided you're on your own. And I think that they, I can show you, I can share some data about how it's not incremental. It, it, it's, it's really, it's a choice. It's an on off switch. If you're a senior, I am not, I am too old and in not good enough shape to bike in a way that I'm scared. And yeah. that's comes into sort of this idea. Here we go. And I love this tweet so much. It got a ton of love. Um, I'm on a bike lane. I'm on the highway. I'm riding on the combination highway bike lane that, you know, a certain city thinks is bike infrastructure. And, you know, this is nobody's fault. We've gotten here through a million just you know, misbeliefs. And one of them, I think, is this idea that we can incrementally make, take a terribly unsafe bike lane and just kind of inch it forward. And I think, you know, um, uh, to, to, to quote somebody who was on our, our podcast, Dave Campbell, as he said, you know, he's been trying this for 25 years. It's like, we don't mix sidewalks and cars. Why do we mix bikes and cars? And this idea that you make this quantum leap from about, you know, absolute ceiling of 8% mode share, which is New York and Portland. Portland's the Amsterdam of America. And this is all great, but you make a quantum leap to 80% of people will bike once you make it safe. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's important to be very, very clear that the, there's a difference between the, the infrastructure and how the infrastructure kind of works with the overlaying culture of, of where this is happening. And so this is, this is a, a nice little graphic that you guys have here on the secret to a happy bikeable, bikeable streets. And really what we're looking at trying to do here is create systems where we're not limiting the number of people that will feel comfortable riding in the environment. There's a misperception, though, that, you know, and, and really it's all about speed. So that and that's what this slide is here is is we have to be very, very clear and open with the fact that this is such a telling, uh, you know, graphic. It's a horrific graphic, but it it really gets to the point of of understanding what helps people feel comfortable in their environment on their streets in their public spaces and i, I mean on honestly the, this has been one of the most um gratifying messages to be able to get out to try to help break through the the and and resonate with as many people as possible yeah and i think it's the fly in the ointment it's the thing that's breaking the whole system is the is that we're not we're not realizing someone said we're a frog in the water. We don't, I, it took COVID for me to realize, wow, when you take the cars that are going 70 miles an hour on the street next to my house, right? Like it's, 
it's so scary. And we just, I think we didn't, I didn't realize. And then once this, the cars were gone and I'm interviewing people all over the world hearing this and I'm like, it suddenly just all made sense. Like you just have to slow the cars down. And what it's, this is, what is the speed you want the car going when they hit someone? Nine miles an hour, everybody walks away. 20 miles an hour, you have a 10% chance of killing someone. And that's really hard on the drivers. And we, you know, it's really frustrating to have people, you know, fight bike lanes. But when you talk to them, they're like, I'm afraid of hitting someone. That's a really different conversation than like, you know, I, you don't deserve a safe bike lane. And I think that's where the empathy comes in, not just for the people who are fighting it, but also this idea of what is the speed you want the car going? And then when you ask people nine miles an hour, or 20 miles an hour, and like, if it's involving children or really anyone, you're like, I don't want people hit by a car. Zero. That's actually the answer. And that really starts to change how you see what is a bikeable street? Because if you never want a car hitting a kid, what do you do differently? Kind of everything. Yeah, yeah. The, the next uh, image here and graphic here is uh, the, these are not the same. And, and they're not the same. And, but what is interesting is that the photo on the right is, is actually a shared street. It's actually not just a bicycle street. It's actually a 15 mile per hour street. It's a 30 kilometer per hour zone. It's what they call a feet strut uh, in, in, in the Netherlands. And it, it's, it's an environment where it's very frequent that the number of people on bikes far outnumber the, the number of people in motor vehicles and, and people go people drive at very, very safe speeds and they are inherently can, safe. Can I? Yeah. Can, do you want to go back really quickly? Sure. Okay. So the 18 is 30 kilometers an hour. And yeah. That, so yeah. 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 18 is 30 kilometers per hour. Yeah. So n the one earth would be nine miles an hour, um, right. which is 15 kilometers. Sorry. I, did, I just thought we, we, you... It might be yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's a good. That's a great clarification. Yeah, on this particular graphic here, when we look at true woonerfs, where it is a true play street, a pedestrian priority street in in the Netherlands, uh, they're looking at targeting right around fifteen kilometers per hour, or somewhere around nine miles per hour in that environment. Very few people are actually on that street in a motor vehicle trying to get to a place. If, if anything, they're probably just trying to get home to park their, their, their vehicle. Uh, it's a very, very ultra slow speed environment. The bulk of the, the Dutch network, uh, nearly 70% of the Dutch network is actually what's considered shared space where, um, or some form of shared space. Some of that is Wooner for very, very small portion of it is, is Wooner and very, ultra slow speed, but the majority of it is 30 kilometers per hour, which is right around 17 point something miles per hour. And those are the feet struts and the edge lane roads, advisory bike lane type roads and other types of shared space. And it's considered safe in, in that environment because it is a it, it's it's like this culture of understanding that as a driver you are going to stay behind you're going to be patient and you're not you know you're not going to force the matter and uh, and we can all we can debate whether that type of environment that type of shared space would ever work in the United States I would say that it probably will but it's going to take time to get that sort of shift to happen. And it's really traffic calming that needs to take place with the modal filters and things of that nature to make sure that, oh, people who are in a hurry are not going to be on that street in the first place. So, and, and even if they were, they're going to have to divert off that street very, very quickly because it, it's not a through route for them. Right. No, I, I, that's such a wonderful way to explain it. And I didn't know that about the 70% of winners. That. Well, yeah, yeah. So that is like the, the or the, shared street. Sorry, yeah, that that is like the thing. Everybody thinks of protected and separated infrastructure uh, in in the Netherlands and in in Denmark, but in reality, the bulk of their network is not protected and separated. It's actually shared space with slow speeds. Most right. of it in the thirty kilometer range. And the beautiful thing about thirty kilometers that is is that is a speed that where you just don't, you don't even have these, you don't have this 
The reason why this doesn't exist as much or it isn't as applicable is because it's slow enough. It's close enough to human speed when you're on a bike and because you're tra- traveling probably about that speed too, is that the, the collision just never occurs. It doesn't show up on the st- mm-hmm. statistics because it was avoided completely. Right, right. Yeah, I, I love I, I love this series of photos, and I think that this is a wonderful way for us to take that conversation and let's blend it towards some of these visions that you all are having uh, of uh-huh. what a livable communities could be in, in the L.A. context. Talk, talk a little about about this series of, of images that we have here. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we wanted to marry. Obviously, you need walkability, bikeability and transit. And so we we sort of split it up. So walkability was those old historic main streets. So LA was a a city of 400 villages that got connected by trolleys and then later cars and everybody biked, as you said. And those, that fine grain retail exists and that gives you your walkability and Hollywood Boulevard is actually a great spot. Now, how do you get the bikeability? So what we realized is that Everybody's been trying to do 50 minute cities for decades, right? As an LA has. And there are already these plans in place. And this is called Heart of Hollywood. And it's an eight blocks with the Walk of Fame, which is really wonderful. And people love to go visit. And so they wanted to create this tourist area that's, as you can see, very slow cars, lots of alfresco dining. They kind of hid the bike lanes because they're controversial, <laughs> wide in the sidewalks, and just create this really wonderful place. And they have four designs for the street, and one of them is pedestrianizing it. So what's interesting about this is that you you don't want Carmageddon, especially in L.A. People are very sensitive to traffic. And so they'd already done the math that you can take the cars off Hollywood Boulevard. It's, an, it's a unique street because it dead ends. So already it's not like an a artery through the city. It's tucked at the base of the hills. So when when streets come up, they kind of end like a block later. So again, you're not in this high traffic area. And they have movie premieres at, at the theaters you can actually see there. Um, they have movie premieres and different premieres all the time. So they know how to take the cars off that street. So we wanted to hook into existing community plans with a ton of you know, positivity. And that's another thing we're just trying to do is like, hook into like the positive, what, right? Like rather than try to like shame or scold or like, you know, like do a power play on people. It's like, you know, we're at a standstill. How can we all come together and do something both thoughtfully, intentionally, um, but also has broad appeal. So Hollywood already has this plan. People are already excited about it. It's like, let's hook into this. You slow the cars. And as you just said, Really, if you want to get bikes, you pretty much, and the Dutch will say this, only have to slow the cars down. Of course, protective bike lanes and that you need those on all the corridors. But to create a little neighborhood, you really just want very few cars. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, they're they're kind of their standard that they use in that systematic safety that you were referencing is that uh, for any street that is more than 30 kilometers per hour, that's the dividing line as to when they require um, the the protected and separated infrastructure for cyclists, uh, for people on bikes, not cyclists, for people on bikes. (laughs) They don't identify as cyclists, they just identify as people on bikes. Um, (laughs) But I, and, and I guess one of the things, too, to think about, because you mentioned in this visual here that the bike lanes are kind of hidden because they're, they, they're kind of controversial, is that I wonder if we really are doing ourselves a disservice to continually kind of refer to them even as bike lanes mm. uh, versus some form of mobility lane. I mean, one of the, the most... Uh, I think most encouraging and, and beautiful images that we have when we look at you know, the people who are out on the streets, uh, in, in, in the, uh, in the quote unquote bike lanes in the Netherlands is oftentimes they are people on mobility scooters in wheelchairs. I have, t- I have two family members who can't drive due to a disability and more people can use an adaptive bike. More people with disabilities can use an adaptive bike than can drive. So for people, a, a lot of us are very you know, passionate about the issue of accessibility, you know, as I said, for family members or just yourself, um, 
uh, we, we lose our ability to drive. We outlive our ability to drive by seven to 10 years. So seniors get trapped in a suburban home. It becomes a crisis of loneliness, or you have to move far away from your kids to live in, you know, a place, the villages is a hundred thousand seniors in Florida with no cars. It's golf carts because you can drive a golf cart and a trike. Um, so I, I, I think that's such a good point that this is really about, um, somebody said to me, LA pushes out people who don't, who can't drive. We don't, and we should be a city for everyone. This is what we're talking about here. The, we're, when we talk about trying to, you know, change the environment for the better, for the positive, to encourage people to be able to to get around. Um, it, it, you just mentioned it, you know, being able to feel comfortable jumping on a bike, a comfortable upright bike to be able to run and run some errands throughout our lifespan. Yeah. And I love this woman with her, with a basket on her bike and two baskets. It's, this is, and, and look at the dress she's wearing. This is a very dignified way to age. It's a dignified way to get around. If you don't have mobility, it's, and, or you don't want to spend the money. And that's, I mean, you talk to Gen Zers, they don't want to own cars. Volkswagen did a study and I think like more than 60% of Gen Zers never want to own a car. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, it, it really is. And in terms of a lot of the stuff that I've been working on over the last 15 years is, is this concept of a culture of activity, of really instilling within communities, within neighborhoods, this this uh, just sort of de facto way of life of where, yeah, of course, uh, we're going to be physically active. We're going to be, you know, have this sense of play and sense of fun. And this, this photo just says it all for me is, it, you know, you've got a, an elderly uh, female, she's on a skateboard, she's carving it up. This looks like it is probably an open streets event. Uh, which are fantastic. Ciclovias are fantastic for, for being able to reframe what our streets are for. Talk a little yeah. bit about that, because I think that that's, that's something that is, is a bright spot, you know, that's happening in the L.A. Basin area of helping to, to move that along. You, obviously, COVID, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the, the lockdown and the pandemic helped move that along a little bit as well. But so do these events like uh, like Open Streets and, and uh, Ciclovia. Yes, yeah, I think Ciclovia, we, we almost think of our neighborhoods as Ciclovias. And it's it's, you know, it's very um I think Ciclavia, what's so interesting about Ciclavia is that when you take the cars off a street, within minutes, it fills with bikes. And it's like nature is healing. We want a bike. It's our happiest form of transportation. And but it's simply an issue of fear and very well-founded fear. Um, so I, you know, I think that if we could build one of these and, and people could experience it, they would, it's just so hard to imagine LA you'd ever live without a car. And I think if people could experience it, they'd see that it's a really wonderful way of life. And, you know, if you've ever been to the Netherlands or you've been to Copenhagen and you've experienced it or just immersed yourselves in, you know, fabulous streets films and stuff like that, it's it really works. And but it's just it's like you have to take the red pill. <laughs> you got to see the Matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or take the orange pill, you know, tune in and watch uh, some of Jason Slaughter's Not Just Bikes videos. Take that orange pill. <laughs> and I love the, the the cargo bike revolution that's really taking hold here and really normalizing the activity of what we can do by bike. Uh, we don't have to buy a multi-ton $60,000 SUV to be able to get the family around. Yeah, they're outselling. I think cargo bikes are outselling cars in Europe now. And if you've ever had a toddler, you know, trying to get them into a car seat versus, hey, do you want to go for a bike ride? Um, and I think, you know, moms, they love exercise. You're, you know, they call it the juggle fest. Life is a mom, you know, working mom, you know, there's a, you got a lot on your plate. And it's, 
having a lovely trip in a cargo bike, taking your kids to school, taking them to the park. It can be life-changing for your finances, for your health, your mental health. Kids love it. It's like we slow down when we have little kids. And this fits better with that life for many people. And I think that's the other thing we always want to emphasize is that it's not for everyone. And, you know, we say to people like, you're not everyone. Just because you wouldn't do it doesn't mean you are everyone. And have, you know, all of humanity is you and needs four cars or whatever you need, you know, you have four kids going in four to four states or four different sports events. There are times in your life where you need different things. And, you know, their neighborhoods, we've be, we're going back to a city of neighborhoods. So I live in Larchmont. I never leave Larchmont. I, I have a little main street. I have, you know, 90% of my errands are right there. It's wonderful. We all walk. It's like you want to be with humanity. And I think that that's this idea of creating, you know, the Livable Communities Initiative is this idea of creating little neighborhoods there where you slow the cars down and you have this bikeable life. And But, you know, it's hard for people to hear the bikes, but it really is what it is. And the bikes, the bikes unlock the transit. And that's where it becomes a climate issue is that if you can't get people on, on bikes and transit, they're stuck in cars. And we know that EVs won't scale in time for our climate goals. They just, the, 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 it's, it's the supply chain. It's the embodied carbon of building them. There's so many issues. We need all EVs. We should just, you know, just sell EVs a thousand percent. But the climate scientists are saying we need bikes. They think e-bikes open this potential for this revolution. And as you just laid out, you got to slow the cars down to get the bike. So slowing the cars down turns out to be the key that unlocks everything. And I would say that's why speed cameras and, you know, automatic ASE, automatic speed enforcement, that is the key law. And Laura Friedman, our, our assembly member in Los Angeles, is trying to change that law in California, because if you can slow the cars down, you get the bikes and then you get the transit. Yeah. One of the things that that pops into my head, as you were just saying that, I want to go back to this uh, image w- with her on the uh, the skateboard here, is I wonder if we're doing ourselves a disservice as uh, veterans of the fight in, in bicycle advocacy and, and like, you know, it's been this war, you know, it's the war on cars. And, and it's and I wonder if we're doing ourselves a disservice by... <laughs> <laughs> overemphasizing, yeah, it, by overemphasizing <laughs> that battle, because people who mm. are like just getting into this and are discovering micro mobility and a one wheel and a skateboard, an electronic skateboard, and and, and just finding a, or an e scooter, you know, just kind of like, oh no, this is just logical, pragmatic mobility choice. And they have no clue that there's this whole culture war past. I, I really do wonder whether we're, we're hurting ourselves by assuming that it's going to be just such a, a fight at every single turn. I don't know. I love that. I love that you're saying that because what I'm finding is that even the people who fight bike lanes, when you explain to them, they hate the bike lanes because they don't think they're safe. And they're right. And I really see both, you know, that there's... I think bike lanes are incredibly important, but I understand why people fight them. And then when we say, well, let's be well, clear about what type of bike lane you're talking about. Yeah. That type. Right. Yeah. On the left. And so they're like, this is a nightmare as a driver. I would never use it. No one would ever use that. So I think that moving the conversation, it, it's, it, you're right. Like, cause there's two, there's two levels of the conversation. There's the political, the electeds, the engineers, you know, LA DOT, the DOTs. And then there's the people who, they don't have time to even know what, like most people don't know what a DOT is, right? <laughs> they have no idea what you're talking about. But if you, if we make the pitch that let's do bike lanes, let's do them safe. Let's do them right. They quickly can get on board, especially if you, if it's honestly, like I, I actually have seen people come do a 180 on this. Once they understand, yes, the bike lanes are unsafe and they're unsafe by design. So let's change. Um, there's a movement afoot to change how we actually classify a, a bike lane. Right now, our classifications, all of them are unsafe by, by my standards as somebody who needs Dutch level safety. I, I'm just, I'm too fearful to risk my life. I won't bungee jump. I'm never going to hang glide, right? I'm, I'm not, never going to do risky behavior. I'm too old. Yeah. And I and I love the in the video that Westwood Boulevard was was looked at, and you had this uh, opportunity to look at the before and the after, and this sort of illustrates 
uh, you know, the possibility of, of what we're talking about when we're talking about creating a safe and inviting all ages and abilities facility mobility lane. That's what we'll call them. We'll call them mobility lanes where people on bikes can be there and, and you can have your e-scooter there. And by the way, there's still parking here. Take a look. We've got some parking. This is a parking protected facility. We also have some outdoor dining and, and cafe activity and, and, and by the way, we're, we're hitting that target of being a truly safe speed at, at 10 miles per hour here. Um, I think that that's where the power of these types of visuals and maybe even pop-up installations really kind of help bring people along in, in understanding what we're talking about. Because when we really look at the data, and we ask people through polling if they would walk and bike to places, they say, yes, they would, if it were safe to do so. Right. And the Dutch say that if it's safe and pleasant, people will bike. And the more pleasant it is, the further they'll bike. And the more fast and frequent the transit is, the more they'll use it. So it's really, it's a quality issue. It's, it's giving people and saying, we want people to bike, so let's give them that safety. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and here's the, the Westwood Village images here. Um, again, taking a look at this and the before and then the visualization of how we can do that. What I love about the, this visualization between these two images, too, is the emphasis on something that I think needs to be talked about much more openly. And that is the role of street trees and canopies, street tree canopies in this. And so we see the, the strategic use of being able to utilize the, the trees and creating a tree canopy uh, tr to try to you know, help with that heat, heat island effect. And so you have that ability to get some shade onto the pedestrian realm and onto the mobility uh, you know, lane realm there to be able to encourage that active mobility as much as possible. Yeah. And, and these are slightly unrealistic. I know it's been, you know, people have told me, but that's, you know, the idea is eventually you get your kissing canopy. Um, you really grow them out and it changes everything. And one thing is like, you know, it's also an equity issue that this we're talking about building affordable housing in safe neighborhoods where it's safe to not own a car, essentially, and pleasant to not own a car. And this idea that everybody should live on a tree lined street, everybody should have the quiet and calm of a suburban neighborhood. Um, and then there's serious health implications of living near traffic. It's, it's the pollution and the sound. The sound actually increases your risk of dementia. It incre the, the pollution increases your risk, obviously, of asthma, but also um, MS and Alzheimer's. So there are real safety issues. And LA is having a conversation, all cities, I think, where do we put housing? Where do we put either subsidized affordable housing or just workforce housing, you know, small units? I know. I know. Let's put it here. So, and that's why I love this exactly. before and after um, for uh, as well is because it talked about this in the in the video as well about the gentle density of being able to, to to build up. And so, not only do we see the trees coming into into this environment now, we've got the mobility lane, we've got the the tree canopy, and oh by the way, and we're also getting that gentle density in, in here. Uh, we're we're trying to make the point that it yeah it doesn't have to be a 40 story tower right next to a single family home, but you can have that concept of going, you know, from a single story, uh, let's, let's go up a few stories. I mean, Paris is absolutely delightful at the majority of Paris being, you know, four to five stories. Right. Somebody said to me that if all of LA was zoned for three stories, we'd fit 10 million people. So we're 4 million people. <laughs> like we don't need to go higher. And what we when we were talking to people who historically fight housing, you know, sometimes called dimbies, the height is a huge issue. They, they only have three things they really care about. Traffic and parking is one. That's the most. Height, they don't like tall buildings. Angelinas don't like them because of earthquakes. It's just like a sticking point for people. And then ugly architecture. And so if you can solve those three, we have found honestly, universal support. We have yet, even people who fought us at the beginning, and like, it's all like a very mature conversation, right? Because we're, it's like, you're talking to your neighbors, you're not going to get in a screaming fight with them, you have to live here. And, but when you talk to them, if you can get them for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, like a Zoom, 
people, they, they agree with it and then they bring their own ideas and we start to evolve it. So I think that going back to cl- the way cities were built is people, it appeals to people. Yeah. You're on the ground. You're, you're knocking on doors. You're in your neighborhood trying to have these conversations. What advice do you have for people who need to do this? Cause that's one of the things that I keep talking about is y- you want to see change you know, don't, don't look to leadership to make it happen. You need to start talking with your neighbors. What advice do you have for being able to do that successfully and not having it devolve into fights? (laughs) (laughs) I got yelled at for many years. I was like, okay, (laughs) all right. I I hear you that you feel strongly about this. So, Um, so what advice do you have for, for avoiding being yelled at or, or is that just kind of Yeah, we methodically built the case through conversations of where we took the feedback and people said, you know, we don't like this. And what about this? What about this? And like, all right, let's go talk to experts. And we pulled in, you know, we're lucky to have UCLA right here, but anybody can do office hours at the, the professors want to get the information out. They live for this. And they're like, we sit in our, you know, in our rooms typing up this data and these, you know, research. And then the activists have to go out and actually spread the word. And I, I think it's, it's when you meet people where they are and listen to them and don't scold and shame them and tell them they're a terrible person for, you know, their views, you know, on the height of a building. And I, th- there, we have such a horrible history in this country with redlining and racism. So there's so many layers of this conversation. But so then it becomes about unpacking it and actually work with DEI specialists, diversity, equity, inclusion advisors and they're in our brain trust, like people who really understand this issue, because we want to look at everything also through the the lens of anti-racism and the, the sort of find the moral center. What is the right thing to do? And then, so every, we're constantly eating because LA is so different than a New York City, than a Boston, than an Austin, Texas, right? What, what, how do you operationalize this in a way that people are comfortable with while also, as I said, just making sure that everything you're doing has, um, we're, we're doing it for, with, with the lens of equity and the lens of efficacy, that it's going to work. Um, and I think when you can convince people this could work, that is, that's another thing they get really excited about. We all want to solve our housing crisis. Austin probably doesn't have the crisis that LA does, but it's, we all want to solve it. And, and the math points the way. Yeah. So we were scrolling through some beautiful imagery there. Is that one of the things that you have found uh, success with in terms of being able to show some vis- visualization? Yes. And I think that I, I think that the, the pictures, in, if you're on bike Twitter or housing Twitter, you're seeing them every day, right? We yeah. all see them. And it's it, it, it lights up my life when I see these pictures. Here's a double decker freeway through a residential neighborhood in Seoul, Korea, and they took it down and turned it into one of the most beautiful linear parks in the world. And it's a destination now. And it's an amenity. And it when they put the high line in, in New York, the apartments around it doubled or tripled in value. That is a lot of money. (laughs) So people, I think when people also understand. Let's pause for a second and and talk about that because oftentimes as urbanists, we, we, we say those words, but then sometimes the, 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 the kickback is I don't want my property values to, to, to go up because that's part of what's going to displace me. You know, as my property taxes go up or as I can't afford uh, the rent in in my neighborhood as they do that. So it's I I guess one of the things that we have to do as as urbanists and trying to to push for more livable communities, uh, we realize that, yes, that is a good thing that we need. We do need property values to go up. Uh, but you, it was mentioned, uh, I think in the, in the video is that the, the goal is that we are not displacing people. We're, we're being able to kind of keep people in place and actually be able to help with their ability for wealth creation and be a, and being able to, to be part of that and, and not being left behind. You, you just touched on like three or four of the most important issues. And if you go to slide 14, because displacement is is a huge issue. It's the uh, horrible history, d- displacement and gentrification. And so what 
when we first started this out, we asked the question, where should our housing go? We have to build 500,000 units. We, we accept that. And then now where should it go? And what we were educated on by a a lot of the equity groups and the um, advocates in LA is this concept that was passed by the LA City Council that, called the Equitable Distribution of Affordable Housing. And it broke the city into five areas. And it became really clear that certain neighborhoods have not built their fair share. They haven't built enough affordable housing, creating displacement in low-income communities and communities of color. And it also means you get these super commutes. So we're all, it's not working for anybody. So this concept of, of building in high opportunity neighborhoods near jobs, amenities, and transit became sort of part of what we were doing. But then it's also, so there was another idea floating out there, which was building long commercial corridors. It was actually written up as a paper by an, a fantastic architect, Angie Brooks, a real thought leader in urbanism. And she said, this is what's wrong with the city is we can't build on the corridors. Well, the corridors don't have any housing. So that was very appealing because you won't displace any of the existing tenants. To, to your point about property values, it is really scary for your neighborhood to change. I've actually seen my neighborhood change, and it's it is it's very disconcerting. In California, your your property taxes won't go up, so that's a small thing that's unique to California. So if you're a homeowner, you have you're at a low risk of displacement, or you know it's it would be a choice. And of course, you know sometimes there's so much money involved that actually does create a, a unwanted pressure. In terms of rents, we have to protect renters. That has to be part of it. Is when housing comes, uh, when a when a beautiful, if you create a linear park through a neighborhood, which I'd love to see, I think a lot of people would love to see, you have to protect the renters around it. And and then you touched on something else really important, which is attainable home ownership. LA has a horrible situation where 400,000 Angelinos are essentially trapped renting, but they make enough money to buy a, uh, like a, an apartment. And we don't have them. We don't have $500,000 apartments here or $750,000 apartments. And we could build those and they will pencil out if we, if we allow them. And I can talk you through how. And that is an opportunity to, as you said, build wealth. That's the American dream. Close the intergenerational racial wealth gap. Yeah. Well, like we said earlier, everything's interrelated and, and connected. <laughs> Is there anything that we haven't yet touched upon that you want to make sure uh, to share with the uh, the audience um, today? I'd love to talk through the standard plans if that's of interest to your audience. Sure. Let's do it. Walk us through what we're looking at here. So we wanted to understand how to build housing and why we can't build housing. So we did a feasibility study and we took a it was a parcel for sale in Culver City, uh, you know, $1.2 million is a pottery studio. And it was like a, a an auction. And how do you build housing above this? And so if you go to the next slide, we had an architect in our group just offered to said, I'll, I'll do a building. So he designed a building that fit on this very narrow lot. So parking, as you said at the beginning, drives everything. Because if you're going to have parking in this building, you actually need to buy one of the lots next to you. Because 25 feet isn't enough to turn cars around. You have to do 40 feet. And by the way, this building comes in four or five stories. So it's like seven units or nine units. Where are you going to put 18 cars? <laughs> It's not possible. So uh, the, uh, automatically, every single parcel in LA was not knocked out unless you could assemble lot assembly. Lot assembly drives up the price of land because you get holdouts. So you're into like an endless catastrophic failure. So if you go to the next slide, we also wanted to understand how to do beautiful housing with air and light because this is we want to build housing that we'd all live in, right? At a different stage in your life when you're young, maybe you're older, you know, you you know, you want to you have small kids. This th this could fill a ton of needs. And if you go to the next slide, we we realize that we have all these rules, decades of rules that are just hurting housing, front yard setbacks that serve no purpose and actually don't, they make the architecture less pretty, side yard setbacks, parking, rec rooms, which are actually interior rooms of shared space for the building. Well, with nine units, people may not want a rec room. They may want another, you know, closet or a bigger living room. All of this depends on something called vertical core design. It's sometimes called single staircase. And if you go to the next slide, this is 
a technical, wonky, only interesting to certain people <laughs> reform. And we ended up writing a bill because you can build these beautiful buildings that are built all over the world, all over Europe. They're built in New York and Seattle, but they're illegal in California. And if you go to the next slide, and there is nothing wrong with this housing. This is the housing we have to build because of parking and because we do something called double loaded corridors. And it means you don't have cross breezes and you, you get less light. And it's just, it's perfectly lovely and wonderful and housing and it's important. But we also want to let single parcel owners build. And if you go to um, the next few slides, again, housing Here's a great visual of, of the housing we want versus the housing we might not want, which is, and here's an example of the housing we want. Walkable streets, fine grain retail. And by the way, the fine grain retail gets you the walkability, right? So we start to like, it's everything's interconnected, as you said. Again, where would you put parking? You can't put parking. So we looked at how do you build this? How do you let one parcel owner? And one other side note is, and this is where the feedback loop helps so much. We talk to property owners. They're like, we're never going to sell. I pay no taxes. You know, we prop 13. We have no taxes in California on property that you've owned for three decades, 10 decades, you know. And a lot of them, it's like, it's 12 cousins inherited from their grandfather. They're never going to agree to sell. They get passive income. So how do you catalyze? It's the ADU model. Let people build ADUs in their backyard. The government has to doesn't have to pay for it. We should save those precious resources for our most vulnerable citizens. And you you just let you unleash individuals to build housing for themselves, their family, their friends for some some, some income. Yeah. And so this brings us to, to to two main things that we're talking about. We're talking about zoning and we're talking about, you know, parking reform. So both of these are policy related things. Is there a fair amount of momentum heading in that direction uh, to be able to have those things, you know, get improved in the state of California and in the Los Angeles area? So we are seeing a lot of momentum for change. We have a housing crisis and we're trying to, we've taken pieces of it and now we're trying to pull it all together and operationalize it in certain neighborhoods. But the laws that have to change are vertical shared access and assembly member Alex Lee, who's a real housing advocate, just introduced a bill we co-authored, you know, co-sponsored, I should say, to, to change these rules in California. And we, I, I think that there's momentum. We're we're working with about six different cities. Everybody has their own building codes, but people are starting to understand this innovation that was brought by Ed Mendoza, who's a former city planner and is our policy director. He had this brilliant idea of don't try to jam beautiful architecture through our existing code because it doesn't really work. <laughs> Change the code. Let's rewrite it. Let's go in and make everything safer. And if you go to the next slide, do something called standard plans. And standard plans are, they exist, they, it's actually how Paris was built. You have architects, you can do a competition, you can have just people like offer them up. And every parcel in any city, it's, they're all the same size by design. So every parcel on the street is either a double lot or it's a single lot. And so you can do design a building that fits every single parcel. And this does a couple really cool things. One is they're pre-approved, 24-hour permit. And they, we know that they work. They have to be, you know, everything has to be safe. So you still have to do 90 days at the city, the Department of Building and Safety. But it's not four to seven years, right? So we're down to these can get built in a year. So that starts the economics to work. Because right now we have an economic failure, a market failure. You can't build affordable housing without losing money. We're trying to make it so that you can make some money. This is not big money. These are not big developers. These are builders, right? Con contractors, carpenters building a small house, a four-story house. There are four stories, mansions, dot the our entire coastline, right? They, they So these are small houses. And if you do, um, if you keep going through these, you can do these standard plans. We already have a model in the city for ADUs. You go to our website of uh, uh, LA Building and Safety, you download 78 ADU models, pre-approved. And it's actually how Paris was built. You can see here, there was a standard plan designed by Hausman. It's not all of Paris, it's some of Paris. And it's these buildings we all know, and they're beautiful. And they're just variations on a theme. And you can see the red lines on this map they were built in 20 years, in the 1800s. 
<laughs> we, we, they rebuilt a city, um, but not all of it, just part of it. And that's what we're really talking about. Build, decide where we want the housing and then let the community decide what we want it to look like because the builders don't care what they build, but the community really cares. The idea of picking a vernacular um, and we do it all over the world, one height, order and variation, different colors, different just details and this, again, incentivize the housing we want. Stop trying to use housing. And this is what we incentivize. We incentivize housing like this. Right. And let's stop doing that. Yeah. And incentivize. Please, let's stop doing that. <laughs> now, I'm sorry. Did you also say that, uh, that, that parking uh, w- was addressed at the state level? So we passed AB 2097. It got rid of parking minimums in most of um, California. Yeah. Okay. And, and what, what, and does that give as a, sorry, I'm stumbling over this. I'm dumbfounded. (laughs) So does that, does that mean at the city level that's already been done? Is it, is it been done at state level or it just gives the cities the ability to do it? It wiped out minimums. You cannot have parking minimums and they're, okay. they're carve outs. I think you have to be near a, a bus line. You know, there, there's some, there's, but it's okay. most of LA now, most of every city. Okay. So, um, yeah. Interesting. But Interesting. The developers will still put it in unless you give them mobility. And we know that because Santa Monica got rid of parking minimums in parts of the city and the developers sure. for five years didn't, they still built the parking. So well, that's it's, where. And, and it's not a magic bullet, right? I mean, it's not something that is immediate. I mean, it, it does take time, uh, but, but it is the thing that helps start to open up affordability of construction when you're not being forced to build a whole bunch of excess, you know, parking. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is what we were just talking about is, is that, you know, when we're talking about this challenge of, of trying to build affordably, if, you know, parking is, is required, it it really messes up with the affordability equation. Right. And the, and the catastrophic failure, the, the domino is that when you, if, the, the, the people who fight housing don't want tall buildings and they don't want more traffic and they don't want ugly architecture. The compromise was parking. That got rid of the parking problem, but you still have the traffic problem. So, and to accommodate the parking, you have to build big buildings and go high, right? So in the arch, it kind of kills the architecture for a bunch of reasons. So then you, the pink in the slide is the soft costs and the caring costs. And that's the lawyers, expediters, and consultants you need to hire to get through the neighbors because they're fighting you. And the caring costs are the four to seven years of interest and taxes you're paying to, as you try to get through the neighbors. And then we add on all these fees and rules because, you know, people have spent 30 years telling us all how horrible developers are and they're evil and they're greedy. And Honestly, it's almost not even important how, you know, the, the, the battle lines got drawn long ago. It's, you know, I think the, the, the takeaway is this is like solar, rooftop solar. We want this. So how do we incentivize it, subsidize it, move it along? And the, the individual property owners can get together with a builder and build these. There's some money to be made. And the government doesn't need to subsidize it and we can fast track it and it can solve a lot, not all of our problems, but a lot of our problems. Bring down rents, create vacancies and and just create, um, just build. We have vouchers for every homeless family in L.A. and know where to put them. They're they're in motels. So we need to build housing. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. This is so exciting to see. Uh, I can't wait to get back into into Los Angeles. Uh, I've said this before on the podcast that um, I have just been incredibly impressed by the ability to visit Los Angeles and not have to rent a car. I would, Mm. I'll fly into LAX, I'll have my Brompton with me. I can jump onto a bus that gets me to a transfer to get onto the train. Uh, I can you know, do a couple of transfers. I can make my way all the way to Azusa and then jump off the train, jump on my bike and ride to my grandma's house. I could totally do that. And it's, it kind of addresses a little bit about what we were talking about before, which is, can you actually exist? Can you live in Los Angeles without a car? 
And as that transit build out continues to develop, yeah, the answer is uh, increasingly you can. The magic piece to that is that first and last mile challenge. And that's where the other active mobility overlay, and we were talking about that earlier, is how do we help feed transit by truly inviting active mobility lanes, being able to walk and bike to not only transit, but then afterwards to our meaningful destinations. It's I'm, I'm I, super stoked. Yeah. I love that you're saying this. We, th- we think of the LCI as a TOD, a transit oriented development. Right. And LA has world-class transit infrastructure, as you just said. It's, right. it's it, experts around the world think very highly of it. We and you have a ridership problem. So if you go to the next slide, we often think of a TOD or it's sometimes called a TOC in LA is, is circles around transit stops. So you draw a circle and then you up zone, right? To 10 stories or whatever you want. If you go to the next slide, we started thinking, what if it's a spoke? And this, I think, is the other innovation in our group is that rather than trying to do a circle, literally just doing a street, a 15 minute street, a 15 minute community as you know, in little pockets around our fine grain retail and our existing historic main streets. So the real thing we're tying is historic main streets to our high quality existing transit. And then the idea is like, that's your intentionality. That's where you 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 focus where you want your housing, you incentivize it, you do the standard plans, you, you give everybody everything. You make it incredibly easy. Um, you don't stick it to people. And then let's see, let's see how many people want to live without a car. I think the number is much higher than people think it is. Oh, I guarantee it, it, it is. And uh, Los Angeles is inherently a very walkable and bikeable environment in the sense that uh, you don't typically have a lot of deep snow and ice. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do have some challenges with heat in the, in the heat of the summer, and that's an issue, which is the other point that I was making of, hey, let's think about shade. Let's think about those tree canopies. Let's right. being able to, to do whatever we can. And oh, by the way, if we are going up to you know, reasonable heights, that also helps with some shade. So. Oh, that's a great point. Yes. Yeah. Very good. We're helping. Lindsay, it has been an absolute joy and pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much, John. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Lindsay. And if you did, please remember, give it a thumbs up, (laughs) leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you think your community would uh, benefit from a similar type of effort, the uh, Livable Communities Initiative, uh, head on down into the uh, show notes and the video description down below uh, for the contact information with LCI. They would love to be able to help uh, get more of these going around the country, around the world. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. I'll be back next week with another episode. This is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>